his grueling demands on his apostles and disciples were very familiar to the fiery trials a mystery initiate had to undergo to achieve immortality. Jesus even rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, fulfilling biblical prophecy, but also copying one of the classic depictions of Dionysus as he rode on the donkey. In every way, Jesus made sure to make his life seem quite like the expected Savior. And yet what he said and did was so markedly new and revolutionary. Dionysus had encouraged communion through drunkenness and orgiastic rites, which would set the initiate free. But Jesus urged sober reflection on the reality of his heavenly father, saying that the truth will set them free. Mithra had conquered by sword, but Jesus required man to love even his enemies. Jesus deliberately linked himself with the sun god through parables, but unlike Mithra, Jesus' Father sent his rays of love to one and all, not just to the initiated. And then there were the miracles. Of course, he was also quite familiar with the Jewish expectation of a Messiah who would quote-unquote multiply bread and wine. So what does he do? For his first miracle, he turns water into wine during a wedding ceremony. It was a very familiar tradition having to do with the annual festival of Dionysus, where empty pots would be placed by priests in a sealed room and the following day be found to be miraculously filled with wine. The wine miracle forever linked Jesus' story with that of the mystery hero, the fertility god whose mere presence brought abundance to all. To make sure the deed was sealed, Jesus also multiplied bread and fish for thousands of people. Like Mithra, he performed the usual assortment of miracles, raising the dead, healing the sick, making the blind see and the lame walk, and casting out devils. And in the Egyptian catacombs, the risen Lazarus is not only represented as a mummy, but as an Egyptian mummy. Around this time, he began to prepare his followers for the death that he now knew he would have to experience. He knew from the very beginning, before he was even born, what his mission was and what his strategy was. He intentionally shaped his life to match the mystery hero. And of course, if he was going to shape his life after the mystery hero, he would also have to suffer the fate of the mystery hero, which was always a gruesome death, bleeding and dying on some sort of a cross. He repeatedly told his apostles and his followers that he would have to die in this manner. He said, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The son of man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. He is telling them how he's going to die. And when they told him that, no, you're not going to die this way, he, told, he said, get thee behind me, Satan. Yes, he is going to die this way, and there was nothing that could stop him. He had to fulfill the complete life of the mystery hero, including the bloody death. Like Tammuz, the Muzi, Baal, Osiris, Adonis, Attis, and the Mithraic bull, Jesus repeatedly escaped the vengeful attack of his enemies until he was finally caught and murdered. Like all of them, he was the suffering God who brought salvation to mankind by preparing the way for all his believers, standing as the door to eternity. In the final days leading to his trial and crucifixion, however, Jesus gave us what is perhaps the best clue about his carefully crafted technique in getting rid of the pagan religions and replacing them with his own. It's Thursday night, the night before the Jewish Passover, and Jesus asks his apostles to prepare for the ceremonial dinner because he was about to be taken and killed. But it's not just the night before the Passover. It's also the night before Easter or Black Friday on the spring equinox. As Jesus prepares for his death, the entire ancient world is preparing for the New Year celebration, taking off from work for the holidays, getting together with their families, buying gifts, and having the ceremonial dinner that commemorated the fertility god's imminent death the next day on Black Friday and the resurrection on Sunday when the real celebrations would begin. 
Not only did Jesus have a final supper with his twelve associates just as Mithra had done, but he went one step further and enacted the most famous of all mystery rites, the commemorative bread and wine ritual. Remember that the mystery religions believed that their sins could be transferred to a sacrificial animal, while the spirit of the fertility god could be drawn in to immortalize the animal's blood. After the ritualistic sacrifice, the initiates would drink the so-called sacred blood and eat the now sacred flesh to absorb the qualities of the god and ensure their own resurrection in the afterlife where the same fertility god would receive them. An ancient inscription to Mithras reads, He who will not eat of my body and drink of my blood, so that he will be made one with me and I with him, the same shall not know salvation. Predictably, Jesus intentionally made sure that his last supper is on the same night as the pagan commemorative meal and used the same terminology as is recorded in the Bible itself, saying, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up the last day. Jesus has now repeatedly told his apostles that he's about to die a horrible death, but they still don't understand. The next day, on Black Friday, people around the world would have been sacrificing animals in remembrance of the fertility god's gruesome death. The Jews would likewise be offering animals to the temple for ritualistic sacrifice, holding the Passover a few hours later at sunset on Friday night. Immediately after giving the commemorative ritual to the apostles, Jesus gets to work in making sure his own death happened on Black Friday. How? Have you ever wondered why Jesus told his betrayer, Judas Iscariot, what you're about to do, do it quickly? Why did he tell Judas to do it quickly? He said it for no other reason than to make sure that Judas would betray him that very night. When he revealed Judas as the betrayer in front of the apostles, Judas hurried out knowing he had no choice now but to do the deed that very night before the rest of the apostles got their hands on him. Likewise, when the Jewish high priest got a hold of Jesus in the garden, they knew there would be no better time to kill him than that very next morning, when everyone was diverted by the holidays and preparing for the Passover. In other words, by revealing Judas as the betrayer, Jesus ensured his own capture that night and his crucifixion the next morning. It was all by design. Jesus knew that the punishment for his crimes would be crucifixion on the spring equinox, which meant that his resurrection on the third day would be on Sunday, when the whole world would be celebrating the fertility god's resurrection. Dying on the cross would forever connect him with Tammuz's sign, the cross, or Mithra's sword, and the nailing of Attis on the tree. That's right, Jesus forced it to happen on the day and date he wanted, in the manner which he wanted, and he went willingly to his bloody death without any fear whatsoever. If you have any doubts about him doing it intentionally, you are faced with the task of explaining why, of all the days in the year, he would choose the night before Black Friday to hold the Last Supper, and send Judas off to betray him that very night, ensuring his arrest and crucifixion on Black Friday itself. He had already spent many years evading the authorities who wanted to arrest and kill him, slipping away when necessary. And yet, suddenly, on the spring equinox, he not only makes himself available to the authorities, but does everything possible to have them arrest and murder him on the same day when the entire world was mourning the death of the fertility god. Now, during the New Year celebration customs of Mesopotamia, which happened at the spring equinox, the king was disrobed and dethroned by a high priest as a remembrance of the fall of the fertility god and his subsequent descent to the underworld. During the three days of the king's absence, an imposter king was put in power, in his place, dressed in royal robes and wearing a crown as the mock king. 